I think that that's often our problem, isn't it? That we can grow up in something and be familiar with something, but actually not understand what it really is. We can grow up, you know, in our own country. I used this illustration the other day. You've never been outside of your country. You never learned another language. You don't even really know what it means. You're just, you just, you don't think outside of your own little box and you don't have much understanding of your own country, your own culture. And when you grow up in church, a lot of times that you just accept the things from the time you're young. It's just like, yes, God, the Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Bible, church, etc. And like, you know, those things often become a stumbling block for people because they know all these facts. These children, they grew up in Sunday school. They know all the Bible stories. Sometimes their memories are very sharp. They can recall things that even the adults don't. But, but often what happens is that becomes the substitute for actually knowing God. You know all the facts about God, but you don't know God himself. That's why I've made this comment before that for me, in a certain sense, one of the most dangerous places in the world is a Bible seminary. You say, why would a Bible seminary be one of the most dangerous places in the world? Well, simply for the fact that it's full of knowledge about God. And really, in most cases nowadays, there's a, maybe a few exceptions, but generally speaking, the only goal, the only purpose of a Bible seminary is to fill your head with knowledge about God. And that's a very dangerous thing. Why? Because our nature is so constituted that we will take the knowledge of something as a substitute for reality. So what you'll have is you have somebody who studied in a Bible seminary for two solid years of upper level education, and they come out of there with their heads filled with information about God, but it doesn't mean that they're godly. And it doesn't mean that they actually have a relationship with God at all. It's been pointed out that in America, you can go to a university, you can go to a master's program and learn from instructors about, let's say, business. You could become a, you know, and, and your teachers have never run a business. They've never been a boss. They've never owned a company. They've never started but they're teaching you high-level education about a certain topic that they have absolutely no experience in. That's normal. It's common. It happens every day. So the world as it is now is, is very, un, very impractical. What I mean is that we've substituted a, a knowledge of a subject, in many cases, as the same as knowing that subject. But how many know that's not true? You know, you have these people that are sports experts. I mean, they sit there in their chair and flip the channels on TV, and they can tell you, oh, he should, like, if it's, let's say, it's a basketball game, okay? He should have done this move, or he should have done that. And they're like, no, you can't do They're experts. They know all the right move. Put them out there on the court, the basketball court, and let's see how they play. In other words, it's just mere intellectual information. It's conceptual. It's not practical. It's not real. It's not real. I mean, there's an element of something to it, but it's not the actual thing itself. You know, knowledge is just a seed about a reality. So information or knowledge is not the same thing as the thing that you're talking about. So in other words, knowledge about God is not equivalent to God. It's only, it's more like just a description of something, but it's not the very essence of it. Does that make sense? So you can read a whole book about how to play American style football. You can learn all the rules, you can learn all of the, um, the moves, etc. and you've never played a game your entire life. You can know all the information. You say, I'm a football expert. Well, have you played? Well, no. Well, then you don't know the first thing about football. Your head is filled with knowledge about it, but it's not the experiential knowledge of 
the subject. So the book is fine to read all about football, read all about some sport, or read all about some hobby. Let's say we're going to come up with a hobby. We're going to go surfing. We're going to learn surfing. So we read all these books. We listen to all these online courses. You study the history of surfing all the way from when to when and how all this. Okay, now you're a surfing expert. Get a surfboard and go out there and try it and see what happens. <laughs> you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to get pummeled by the waves. You're going to be under the white water going in circles. Of, whoa, 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 I thought I was a surfing expert. No. You're an intellectual expert, but you have no actual experience of the thing itself. But does it make sense what I'm saying, how the knowledge of surfing, for example, it's not a bad thing. It's fine. It's information, but that's all it is. It can help you, but it's not the same as surfing. So knowledge about God, it's good, it's important, but it's not God. It's only a description of him. So I found that in churches all around the world, children grow up going to church and they have all this knowledge about God. But in so many cases, they've never met God himself. They just know facts about him. And so when they get older, they're bored with church and they leave. They don't want to go to church anymore. They don't. They want to play video games. They want to go. They want to f chase girls. You know, they want to, they want to do certain sports. They, why are they not interested in God? Because they just learned facts about God. And facts are boring after a while. Facts are not the same as the actual thing. And so, but I found the same thing in this country, especially because there's such an emphasis on everybody must have a religion. China, uh, Indonesia is not like uh, many other countries. Most other countries are not emphasizing religion, but Indonesia is a very religious country. It's an extremely religious country in the sense that the government actually promotes religion. In fact, you have to choose a religion. If you want to get married, you've got to get baptized or whatever they do in the Buddhist temple or whatever they do in Islam, but you have to join a religion. That's not everywhere in the world. So, so what, what, what's the result of that? Well, the result of that is... You know how I explained how the children grow up in church knowing about God but not knowing God? But the church must go on, right? Somebody has to get up there and sing the songs. Somebody has to get up there and speak in front of the people. Somebody has to help take the offering and do all these things. Well, who are the people that are doing that? The children that grew up there that never met God. Now they're adults and they know a lot about God. But in so many cases, they've never actually met God himself. They don't actually know God. They're not, they're not hypocrites in the sense that they're not pretending. You understand? They're not pretending to be something they're not. They genuinely don't know. They don't know that what they have is not the real thing. They don't know that their knowledge about God itself is not equal to knowing God. And many of them, especially if it's a charismatic church like Gebe E, et cetera, many of them have experienced miracles or answers to prayer. And so for them, they feel That's this, that, that means God is with me, God is near to me. But they don't realize when Jesus was on the earth, he did miracles for everybody. He did miracles all the time. He did miracles for one group and then later rejected them completely. So it doesn't mean that God is with you it doesn't mean you're a child of God because you've experienced a miracle or because you've seen something supernatural. And so I feel like that's a great danger in, um, in these situations is that people grow up or are, they, they have knowledge of a subject and through human blindness, the pride of the human heart, a lack of humility, etc. We substitute that very thing for reality, for God himself. This, friends, 
is a tragedy. And this is how you have places like Papua or Manado or maybe, let's say, in Ambon, areas in Ambon, where you have areas where they're all Christian. They're Christian. Papua, Christian. Manado, Christian. Ambon, areas of Ambon, Christian. But then you go there, you see they're drinking, they're smoking, they beat their wives, they watch pornos, watch porn movies, they, they, watch, they watch filth on their phones, they, 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 they don't go to church, they, they, but they're Christian, they've been baptized, yeah, but they're not children of God. It's a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity because there's already a foundation of knowledge. Knowledge, let's go back to the knowledge issue. Knowledge is not the same as experience. Knowledge is not the same as the actual substance. It's a description of something that is. But knowledge is important. Knowledge is good. So if you go to somewhere like, let's say, Papua, and you tell them about Jesus, they, know, they already know, oh yeah, Jesus. And you talk about Bertobatan, repentance. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard that before. Or, uh, and they talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard somewhere that we're sinners. And, and they, so it's an opportunity. It's a foundation. You don't have to start completely from zero. There's already a seed there, but it's a dead seed, and it has to be watered. It has to be watered. It has to grow. But, so, this is a tragedy. It is a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity. If you were to go to another area, let's say you go somewhere in northwest China um, where they have no religion, not the Muslim areas, but the just normal Han Chinese, atheist Chinese, and you go there, and they've been raised in China, no God, very, un, they're not religious, they're not like in South China where they're always, you know, do, you know, more involved in Buddhism and idolatry. They have no religion, atheist, and you go there and talk to them about Jesus, you have, you have, you have very little to work with. It's much harder, in one sense, than going to Manado or Papua and telling people that already heard of, they've already heard of Jesus. They already know about, they believe the Bible's true, they just never, they don't live it. They don't know what it says, but they believe, oh, oh yes, this is the, God's book. They will believe it. They might even fight for it, but they don't know what it says. They don't know what it means. But there's a seed there that can be worked with. But we have to be careful that um, we don't fall into that trap. Accepting knowledge of a subject and thinking that that's equivalent to the subject itself. You can hear somebody get up here and preach passionately about repentance. And you can agree with every word that is said. You can say amen the whole way. And you could have never genuinely repented at all. It's, it's possible to vicariously, like in a sense, you agree with something that's not in your life at all. You've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Because it's human nature, we're opinionated. Have you ever noticed that? That's why people like to discuss politics, argue politics. Because we all have opinions. Should be like this. No, like that. And each one is equally convinced in their own mind. And sometimes they're both wrong. But they're passionately convinced like this or like that. It's human nature. If we've been, if something has been like inculcated into our minds, something has been deposited into our minds, especially from a young age, you'll agree with it. And you feel passionate about it. And when somebody says the thing that you agree with, something within you says, that's good, that's right. And so you can feel like you're a lot more righteous than you actually are. Because if you hear a certain type of preaching, you can say, yes, that's true. And you know it's true, but you can be deceived. How? Well, you can think the agreement with it is the same as experiencing it. 
Or agreeing with what is said is the same as living it out. But on the day of judgment, our agreement with truth and doctrine will, ha will, help us, will not help us in any way. We're going to be judged not on what we agreed with, but on what we did. That's the one thing you see that's very clear when the Bible talks about the day of judgment. It's always based on our works. It's not based on what we thought. It's not based on in the sense of what we agreed with or what our doctrines were. It's based on how we lived, what we did, what we said, what we did what our motivations were. And so, so it's something that we have to really be willing to humble ourselves, to examine ourselves, to question ourselves, to see like, so how much of what I agree with, how much of my doctrine is actually present in my life? If you, it depends, like the, the type of church also is going to have an impact on this. In a church that doesn't preach anything, just kind of whatever, <laughs> you won't really feel very passionate one way or the other. It's like, oh, that was a good sermon. Oh, yeah. I don't, what was it about? I don't know. I don't remember. You're like, you walk out the door and you don't remember. What did your pastor preach about a lot? Oh, uh, the Bible? <laughs> well, what? Well, you know, uh, you don't really remember. It doesn't leave much of an impact. So, but there's another case where if we emphasize certain things and you feel convicted about it, it's true. You agree with it. You can fall into the trap of only going as far as agreeing with it, but never actually implementing it into your life. And if you do that enough, if you do that for a while, you'll get hardened and you'll become completely spiritually blind. So you won't even feel it. You won't know it. I'll be preaching directly to you and you will not know it. You'll think it's for somebody else. It's scary. I've seen that happen to people before. That actually the message is for you, but you're not able to hear it at all. You've been hardened. You've been hardened. It happens all the time. Probably almost every Sunday here, there's somebody here in particular that God has spoken directly to them and they have no idea it's for them. They have no idea. They think it's for somebody else. They don't feel like God wants to speak to them or has anything to say to them. They think it's just another sermon. They have no idea that they are the target, that they are the focus, and it goes in one ear and out the other. And it's a scary thing that we could have been literally in the very presence of God and God literally speaking to us, and we didn't hear it. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those who have ears to hear because many people here heard his preaching, but most people, they didn't even bother to recognize this is the Son of God. It must be, every word must be like precious and important. He doesn't waste his words. He doesn't just get up there to say things. He, gets, he came to the earth because he has a message from God that we need to hear every single word of it. And so that's the scary thing with human nature is that God is speaking all the time, but... How many people are actually listening to them? How many people actually believe that God speaks today? And that God has something to say to you and your life? If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't waste my time here. I wouldn't waste my time um, preaching. But God does speak, and this is his word, and he does have something that he wants to say to us. You know, one of the tragic byproducts of the sort of um, growing up around Christianity or coming into Christianity and then just getting comfortable with the types of sermons that are being preached in our church but not really following through with them to not really implement them in our lives. One of the, the tragedies of that is that we don't go forward, we're stuck. We're stagnant and we don't know why. We don't realize, why are we not growing? Why are we not moving forward? Why is nothing changing in my life? Well, it's because we're deceived. It's because we're deceived. How? We think that we are hearing the word of God, but we're actually not really hearing it. I mean, we hear it, but we don't hear it with our heart. And it's, there's a big difference. We hear it with our ear, but we don't hear it with our heart. And so we don't take it seriously, and we don't implement it. And we feel like we have a lot of that. We don't 
We don't value it. We don't treasure it. We don't realize it cost the Savior His precious blood to get this message to us. We don't look at every word as being blood bought or blood paid for with not our own blood, but the blood of the perfect Son of God. And so we don't value it. We don't treasure it. We t- treat it as something common. And if you know the Old Testament well, that's one of the greatest sins that could be committed is to take holy things and treat them as common things. So remember uh, the story, Nebuchadnezzar, he was up on the roof of his palace and saying, is this not the great Babylon that I've built by my own great wisdom and my own great greatness? And then what happened? God's judgment came upon him and God gave him like the, the mind of a beast and he went out for, I don't know how long, but he's living in the forest, his fingernails grow long, his hair, he's, he, he lost his mind. God humbled him and he came back and he admitted God is God. There's only one God and he raises up who he wants to raise up and he, and he removes who he wants to remove. Well, his son came on the scene after him and he's a princeling. He grew up in luxury, grew up in power and now he's the king. So he throws a big party for all of his wives, his concubines and whoever, his officials and he, um, he tells them, remember, his father was the one that God judged. And then he wrote that letter, sent it out to the whole empire about the God of Israel. So the son has this party and sends for the vessels that were taken captive from Jerusalem, from the temple, the sacred vessels, the holy vessels, and says, send for those Bring them into our party, and let's drink wine out of them. So they sent for the holy and sacred um, items that were used in worship, that were so holy and sacred, nobody could touch them in Israel, let alone these pagan kings. So now they got them as an absolute mockery of God. They're drinking, getting drunk out of these things, And it says now that they're worshiping their false gods. They're worshiping gods of gold and silver and wood and stone. And you you know the story. That's when a finger appears on the wall and and writes like uh, four words, I think. Many, many tickled. Yeah, four words on the wall. And they're, they're, they're terrified with fright. Well, what happens is later they bring in Daniel. Remember who Daniel represents the God of Israel. They're mocking the God of Israel, drinking, you know, partying with the sacred vessels while they worship false gods. It's an open affront. It's an open offense. It's an open, I can't think of another word, but affront. Hopefully you know what that means. To the living God. And God steps down and judges him. And that very night, He's killed that very night. He's taken out. He did not take the word of God seriously. He did not take the warning from his own father seriously, even though he knew it. He knew it. And Daniel points that out when he rebukes him. He said, you knew all this about your father. But nevertheless, you sent for the sacred items from his sacred temple. You drank wine out of them while you worshipped gods of stone and gold and silver and, and wood and stone. Therefore, God has taken the kingdom from you and he's given it to another. Well, think about us hearing the word of the Lord hearing the message of Jesus Christ himself, hearing this gospel message, do we take it to heart? Do we treasure it? Do we tremble at the word of the Lord? This is a sign of somebody who, uh, who is godly, somebody who belongs to the Lord. What They tremble at his word. They take it seriously. They don't count it as something common to count The word of God is something common. It's a terrible sin against God. Just like this um, son of Nebuchadnezzar treated the holy items from the temple as something common that they used in idolatry 
Therefore, God's judgment came upon him. If he had just worshipped his idols, God would not have bothered with him. But he took God's sacred objects and used them for idolatry. So we are accountable for the word of God. We're going to be accountable for every sermon that we heard. I'm not sure if we're aware of that. I'm not sure if we're ready for that, but we need to be. And I, I find like 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So one of the great motivations in Paul's life was the fact that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done, the things we do, things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And this he calls the terror of the Lord. Ask yourself a question this morning. Do you have the terror of the Lord? Paul did. Why would I feel the terror of the Lord? Well, what is the terror of the Lord? Well, it's an acknowledgement of the reality that there is a God. There really is a God. He is a holy God. He is an eternal God. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and he's going to judge us according to what we've done. That, if you really know that in reality... It will lead to the terror of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? Knowing who He is, knowing who we are, and knowing what He can do to us. The fear of the Lord brings sort of a, like an obligation. Like we can't just, before you knew the fear of the Lord, you could live however you want. You didn't really worry about it because God was very far away and distant and just kind of thought, well, you don't really think about God. Even though you know, you believe, you might believe there is a God, but you don't really think about it. When you have the fear of the Lord, you recognize, no, I, you, it's, I have to face God. I have to face Him. And, and I, I believe the fear of the Lord is not primarily based on what He'll do to me now, although that's also certainly a part of it. He can make our lives a, a living hell. But the most horrifying thing is the thing that Paul points out here is, what he can do to us on the day of judgment because that will be eternal. Anything we experience in this life, no matter how bad or how negative, how painful, it's only temporary. But the things that come on that day will be eternal. That should give us a terror, a soberness, a reality. It should shake us. And if it doesn't, well, we're blind. <laughs> Simply blind. Don't see. We don't perceive correctly. We're in our own world. And we were, before you come to Christ, everybody's in their own world. They don't know God. They know about God. They don't know the truth about God. They make up their own God or they adjust God in a way that suits them well, that makes them feel comfortable, and they're lost. They go to church. Many of them speak in tongues. During worship, they raise their hands, but they're lost. They don't know God. They don't know the reality of God. Their whole life has been built on assumptions, ideas, 
but no reality, no real encounter with God. And frankly speaking, who wants to know God? Not Adam, not Eve, not after they sinned. They ran from God. And so will you, and so will I. Hide from God. Try to avoid God. Humans, in their darkness, they don't want to face the light because we're afraid our deeds will be exposed. And if it were not for a merciful God, a loving God, a saving God who tracks us down, who chases us down, who comes after us, no one will be saved. No one. Remember, again, just going back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid. God had to go to them they did not come to him. Human nature is such, because here's the thing, once you've tasted of sin, you're ashamed. And one of the consequences of sin is it will bring that shame and you will, you will run from God. You will not want to draw near to God. You'll want to hide from God. You don't want to face him. So if it's not God himself in his mercy and his patience and his kindness and his love that reaches out to us in our fallen state, then no one will be saved. But here's the thing. He also does not force us. If people resist and continually resist his will, he will eventually give them up to their sin. There will be no mercy anymore in those cases. What I mean is there will, he will no longer strive with men. He will no longer work to convict us. You say, at what point does that come? I don't know, but I know this. When Jesus preached to the Pharisees, he was preaching to men that had been handed over to judgment already. So Jesus could clearly predict and prophesy exactly what would happen because they were already handed over to judgment. They'd already resisted the Holy Spirit. They'd already been, God had given them over to judgment. They, were, there was, they could not be saved. They'd missed the grace of God. So Jesus spoke to them in the harshest of terms. Blind guides, whitewashed tombs, sons of the devil, murderers, he told parables directly in their faces that they were going to murder the Son of God. And then, they would walk, then he would walk away and they would start discussing how, we're going to, how we were going to murder him. They were handed over. They were, there was no salvation for them. Scary, isn't it? That somebody in this life could come to a point where they're beyond salvation. Yeah, that's true. It's biblical. Look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh was hardened by God after he hardened himself. So he was handed over. Now God's going to use him, but not for his own good, but for God's glory. Does that mean that God created him to go to hell? Of course not. The Bible's very clear, the decisions that Pharaoh made, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh resisted Moses in his message. Pharaoh was against the people of God. Pharaoh constantly fought against God in his, in his will, and so God hardened his heart. In other words, you're cut off, Pharaoh. There's no turning back for you now. You're going to die in your sins and you're going to go to hell forever. But he still had his life to live. You know, there's many people in this world today that if we could see in the Spirit 
we could see a sign written over their head, condemned to eternal hell. Maybe there's others we'll see. If we could see in the Spirit, there's a sign over them. It says something like, on their way to hell because they're lost. But there's certain people, keep in mind, there's literally a mark on them, doomed to destruction. They're beyond hope. There's no possibility of repentance. How did they get there? That's an important thing to ask because we don't want to get there. Hardening our hearts. Hearing but not obeying the word. Resisting, rejecting. There's something I want to try to express this morning. I haven't really got to it yet. I'm going to try to get to it now. Um, I'm going to pose it in the form of, of a quote uh, by a man named Leonard Ravenhill. He said it something like this. We don't have revival because we're willing to live without it. We don't have revival. We don't have the power of God. We don't have the glory of God filling his temple because we're willing to live without it. We don't have revival because we're not hungry enough for revival. We don't have Miracles, because we're not desperate enough for miracles. See, in the Bible, oftentimes, people either had to get a miracle or they were going to die. The woman with the issue of blood, the man with the daughter who is dying. Um, I mean, so many instances. If they didn't get a miracle, there was no hope. There's no, the, the blind men on the side of the road, if he didn't get healed miraculously by Jesus, he'll be blind the rest of his life. There's no possibility of corrective surgery or something like this. If they don't get a miracle, then there is no hope. And I find that our problem is this. We have many options. Therefore, God is last on our list. We have many options. So God is put at the back. We don't need miracles. Why? We have medicine. We have doctors. We have all these other possibilities. You don't think that's a factor? in the lack of miracles, of course it's a factor. If we're content with church and our Christianity just as it is, it's very likely we will never see anything different. Again, to quote Leonard Ravenhill, we don't have revival because we're content to live without it. If we want to see real radical transformation, we have to get to a point where we can no longer tolerate things as they are. I've noticed a pattern in people. They don't know if they're saved or not. They don't know. They want to be saved, but they don't know if they're saved or not. I can think of three people. Some of them you know. They came to our church, they were in our church for a long, 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 long time. And they could not tell you if they were saved or not. They don't know. They don't know. Well, I could tell you. <laughs> no, they're not saved. They're not saved. But they don't know. 
and you'll talk to them and you'll challenge them and then a month will go by and then another month will go by and then a year will go by and then another year will go by and you'll talk to them and you'll challenge them. Are you saved? I don't know. Are you born again? I think maybe yes now. I don't know. Why is it that they can go day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, without ever knowing if they're saved, without ever being born again. On the surface, it appears they're coming to church. They're very zealous. They're active, involved in everything going around the church, but yet they can go on and on and on and on and on. One of, another person I can think of wasn't around as long, but was definitely around for a while, would ask, well, I don't know. And I'd say, well, you better find out. So well, what do I do? I said, seek God until you know. If you have to, you stay up all night, you pray all night. And they kind of laugh. <laughs> oh, well, it's that hard? Why is it that these three people I have in mind, why is it that to this day I guarantee they don't know? Well, they'll never know because they're content to live without it. Why do you say that? Because I see how they live and I see they allow it to go on and on and on and on and on. They don't fear God. They're not afraid of perishing. Listen, if you knew that today was your last day and then tonight we're going to meet the Lord and we're going to face him in judgment. You would, as soon as I'm done preaching, you would get on your face and you would not get off your face until probably tonight, until the Lord came and we face him in judgment. Because you would say, I've got to be sure that I am saved. I've got to be sure that my sins are forgiven and taken away. But we don't do that. And we put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off because we don't really feel the need. And my concern is that some people will come to church their whole lives and never get saved. And the reason is because they don't need God. They don't need God. Everything goes well for them. They have money. They have family. They have friends. They have health. And they're pretty good people. Somebody like that can go on their whole life and never get saved. If some crisis strikes us, it's actually oftentimes a good thing. We don't want crises to come. But the people that seek God in this life are people that need Him. In Indonesia, everybody can go to church, so it doesn't mean anything. Okay, I want to make that clear. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you're seeking God. But the people that find God in this life are people that need Him. Do you need God? We all know the technical answer to the question. Of course, everybody needs God. It's one thing to know the proper answer, like we learned it in Sunday school. Yes, everybody needs God. It's another thing to know the reality. I desperately need God to change my heart, to change my life, because if he doesn't change me, I'm going to go to hell forever, and there's no hope for me because I'm a sinner. I've broken his laws. I've disobeyed his commandments. I've dishonored his name. Maybe not as bad as other people. It doesn't matter if I'm as bad or not as bad. The point is I've committed my own sins. I'm not nearly as bad as everybody else. There's people much worse than me when I was a sinner. It doesn't matter at all. I was bad enough, and so are you, whether you're aware of it or not. Every individual is bad enough to go to hell for their own sins. You don't need to compare yourself with anybody else. It's just giving yourself a false sense of of uh, self-righteousness. It doesn't help you to compare yourself and think, well, at least I'm not as bad as these people. Well, so what? You'll go to hell for your own sins, not for theirs anyways. 
And the Bible has something to say about people that don't need God. Make sure you're not one of these. Well, how would I know if I'm somebody that doesn't need God? Because you don't tremble at his word. Because you hear his... Notice I didn't say because you don't go to church. <laughs> I'm talking to people that are in church. So, Because when you hear his message, you don't obey it. You don't implement it. You don't tremble at his words. You don't take it seriously. You're not living it out. You're just hearing it. You're a hearer of the word, but not a doer of the word. And such faith will not save you. The faith that saves is a faith that obeys. So Luke 6.24 says this. But woe to you who are rich. That's strange. We would think, man, you're blessed, you're rich. That's not what Jesus says. He says, woe to you who are rich. You say, well, thank God, I'm not like the richest person, so it doesn't apply to me. Well, hold on a moment. Well, what does it mean to be rich? It means to have all your needs met. It means to have an abundance more than you need. It means that you're comfortable in many senses of the word, materially speaking. You don't have to be a millionaire to be rich. Just you have all your needs met. You live a, a comfortable life. He doesn't say blessed are the rich. He says woe to you who are rich. And he says for you have received your consolation. In other words, that's all you're going to get. The little tiny bit of enjoyment that comes out of material luxury, etc., that's all you're going to get. You've already received your reward. That's all you're going to get. Verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. In other words, you have an abundance of bread. You know, that was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. La- laziness, gluttony, abundance of bread. They had abundance of food. They could, I mean, they had everything you could imagine, all this different luxury, different food. Jesus doesn't say you're blessed if you have that. He says you're cursed. Woe is saying cursed. Judge yourselves lest you be judged. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now. You know, there's certain people, as soon as church is over, It doesn't matter how serious the message was. They're laughing. They're joking. It's scary to me. It scares me. But it's very common. The Bible says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you. In Indonesia, I've noticed one thing. People like to laugh a lot and loud. And it's fine to laugh. I like to laugh. We all like to laugh. But honestly, I found that there's a, a culture of mockery here. And it's, 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 it's not good. The thing that I'm talking about, you'll hear people laugh. Ah, I hear it in my neighbors. I hear I, you, you, just this loud mocking laugh. That's all they do is laugh and laugh. laugh. <laughs> it's like, this is not good. This is not godly. This is not holy. These people don't fear God. They don't know God. They're lost. They laugh like that because they're lost. Not because they're having a good time. They may be feeling they're having a good time, but they're lost. They're lost. It's a symptom of being utterly lost. This mocking, laughing, um, kind of just sarcastic, overly, I don't know how to describe it, but um, you've heard it. It's happening constantly, all around us here. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Are you cursed this morning or are you blessed? Who are the blessed ones? We just read the list of the cursed ones. Who are the blessed ones? Luke 6.20. Blessed are you poor. You know, it's one thing to be poor. It's another thing to realize you're poor. This is not just for those that are actually poor. This is for those that realize they're poor. Blessed are you poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. You know, one of the most, 
revolting things, unpleasant things, is somebody that won't admit who and what they really are. And it's human nature. We could be poor, but we want to act rich. We could be dumb, but we want to act wise. It's pride. This, this verse, blessed are you poor, it's not just for those that lack education, lack financial security. It's for those that recognize who they really are because it's possible somebody could have money and have education but recognize their absolute poverty before God. It's also possible for somebody to be um, physically poor, financially poor, intellectually poor, but boast in their great knowledge. It's called pride. But those that are blessed are those that are poor. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Remember those that are cursed, the rich. Those that are not hungry. Those that are full, they're cursed. Well, who are the blessed ones? The hungry. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. See, the people that are full now, the people that are rich now, the people that laugh now, that's all they get. And then it will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But blessed are you poor. Blessed are you who hunger. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. But not now, then. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. See, those that have financial prosperity, they have the world. Better to be poor in all material things and have the kingdom of God than to have all the wealth the world can offer and have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And blessed are you when men hate you. When who hates me? Your parents for the sake of Christ? Your brother for the sake of Christ? Your classmates for the sake of Christ? It's not just a general, generic, whoever will hate you on the side of the street. Those people don't know you. Then who will hate us for the sake of Christ? The ones that know us. Well, the Bible says when they hate you, you're blessed. When they exclude you, the, the stranger on the street will not exclude you, doesn't even know you or bother about you. Who's going to exclude you? Your family? Your classmates? Your friends? Your coworkers? Why? Oh, because they call you fanatic? Because they say you think you're better than all of us? Because you're always condemning us? They have many excuses to persecute, to hate us, exclude us, to revile us, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. If we are cast out for our own sins, we deserve it. If we are hated because of our own wickedness, then we deserve it, and we're not blessed. If we're excluded, because of our own pride, et cetera, et cetera, then we deserve it. But if it's for the Son of Man's sake, then we are blessed. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Why will we go on without revival? Because we're willing to live without it. Why will we potentially continue going forward without miracles? 
because we put our hope and our trust in other means and man rather than God. We trust doctors. We trust medicine. We trust health care. We trust this. We trust that. But we don't trust God. Why do many people go on throughout their lives without knowing if I'm really a Christian or not? Because they're willing to go on without knowing. It's not urgent enough for them. They're not desperate enough for it. I used to have this car that every time I'd get in the car and drive along the road, I would find out that the, the windshield is absolutely filthy. And so when the sun shines on it, it's very hard to see. And if it's like night, even more so. And um, for some reason, I guess I didn't have wiper fluid. So, I, so every time I thought, I was, it's very anxious I'm driving. It's hard to see. It's very, very difficult. And so I would be like, okay, so I'm going to fix this. But it wasn't urgent enough to pull over on the side of the road, or maybe I didn't have anything to clean it. But what would happen is this. I would feel the urgency all the while I'm driving, because it's right in front of my eyes. I would get home, I would pull up in my parking spot, get out of my car, and completely forget it and go about. And then the next day, I'm er rushing early in the morning to go to work, rushing, get in my car, and get on the road. It's like, oh, the windshield again. I got to clean it. But I drive to work, come home, ah, oh, the windshield. And I'd drive, I'd park, and I'd get out and forget about it. The pressure was off. And some of us are like that. You come to church, you hear a sermon, you feel kind of convicted, but you go home and you <laughs> forgot about it. Forgot about it. While you heard the preaching, you were like, oh yeah, I need to do that better, I need to change this or whatever. But as soon as you leave the church, you forgot about it. That's a scary pattern to be in, isn't it? We need the Spirit of God to do a work that goes deeper than that. Or we're just going to be Sunday Christians and we're never going to grow spiritually. It's got to go beyond Sunday morning. It's got to go beyond just hearing a sermon and forgetting about it when we go home. If all of the sermons I've preached here in the last, let's say the last year, if even 50% of what I've preached had been obeyed, <laughs> I mean, I, I cannot even imagine how spiritual our church would be. I imagine that our shadow by now would be healing the sick as we walk down the street. I mean, we'd be like walking with angels on every side. I mean, we'd be like so radical, so fanatical for Jesus. I mean, you would have, some of you would have already sold and given away all your possessions. You'd be living a very poor, simple life, but you would have such a fire in your life. You'd have such power in you. You'd be healing the sick. You'd be, I'm serious. I'm serious. Your family members would be getting saved. Literally. And we wonder where God is, why God doesn't answer our prayer. <laughs> We're asking the wrong questions. Where are you, and why don't you obey his word? That's the real question. Sorry to be so blunt, but after all, I'm representing God, not myself. We say, oh God, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And I can just almost see God saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? I never told you I'm going to answer all your prayers when you live in disobedience. I never told you that all of your prayers will be answered when you don't do my will. I said, when you do my will, keep my commandments, and then whatever things you ask when you pray, believing you'll receive them. Remember when we talked about the, the Magi, the three wise men coming from Iran or wherever from Babylon far away to 
all the way to Jerusalem. I mean, they went on this long, long journey from the ends of the earth. And remember, they met the scribes there, the religious leaders, and they asked, where is the Messiah to be born? They said, Bethlehem. And remember that after that, nobody was even budged. Nobody moved an inch. They all just sat there in Jerusalem while the wise men who came from Babylon continued on their journey. They were so lazy, they would not even go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see the Messiah. But you've got these wise men that came all the way from Babylon to see him. What's the difference? Hunger. Desperation, need. They were content in Jerusalem. They were content with their form of godliness that denied the power. They were content with their false form of religion. And these men, they were probably pagans. They were not probably Jews. But they came and said, we must have God. We want to know the God, the King of the Jews. We want to see the Son. We want to know, meet the Messiah. They came as far as they could. And you got people right there. They can't bother themselves to get out of bed and come from Tokyo to church. We've got people that came from Beijing to come to church this morning. We've got people from Tokyo and the surrounding areas that can't even get out of bed. Why? No need. No need. No need. God, have mercy. Having a real need is one of the greatest things we could ever have. And having all of our needs met is one of the worst curses we could ever have. We all want everything. We all want health and wealth and prosperity, and we don't realize that could be the worst curse that our lives ever experienced. There's a lady... Uh, from Taiwan a couple months ago. She came across our YouTube uh, channel and she told me that for several weeks straight, she listened to my messages all day long. All day long. For weeks on end. Even the English ones, she used some interpreted, I don't know how she did it, but somehow she doesn't really speak English all of those messages. And she could start to tell me stuff I don't even remember. I preached, I have like 900 messages on there. I mean, I, I don't know, she, I don't think she listened to all of them. She said, man, you sure have a lot of sermons. I've tried to listen to all of them, but it's a lot. And her life was revolutionized. That's what she said. She said she wanted to die before she heard those sermons. She gave up, she lost hope, basically at the point of losing her faith almost, wanted to die, did not want to live anymore. And God raised her from the dead. That's how she described it. We have people that come here one morning, hear one sermon, and never come back again. And you have a lady who's not even here, who's in Taiwan, who came across the channel and has listened to probably by now hundreds of hours of sermons. What's the difference? The people that come once, some don't even stay through the whole service. No need. They're not desperate. They're not hungry. If they were, they could meet God here. But they're not looking for God. They're looking for something else. If you really are looking for God, you can find Him here. He'll meet you here. But if you're not looking for God, you won't find what you're looking for here. Paul said concerning need, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God said to Paul, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly will I boast, will, will I rather boast in my infirmities than the power, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures 
and infirmities, and reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the question for us today is, are we weak or are we strong? Are we rich or are we poor? Are we full or are we empty? Are we laughing or are we mourning? The way we respond to this determines everything. Let's pray. Lord, let us make practical decisions. I just want to challenge you today, not so much to an emotional response, because it's easy to have an emotional response, to cry, etc. But then sometimes there's a deception in an emotional response, because after the emotion is kind of worn off, you'll kind of forget about it. That, has that ever happened to you? I think it has. So I want to challenge you to a, a logical response to the Word of God. Where have you been disobeying the Word of God? Where have you been compromising? Or where have you been not really obeying the Word of God that you know you need to? Make a conscious, logical, reasonable choice right now that you're saying practical, a practical, practical steps you're going to take. You're going to make changes. That's how your life will really grow. When there's practical decisions, sometimes you've got to do it right away so you don't forget it or change your mind. <laughs> So I want to encourage you, I want to recommend, if the Lord has convicted you of anything this morning where you're, you know you're wrong, maybe it's pride. You just have this pride and you, you've, you've not humbled yourself and you need to open up to somebody and humble yourself. There could be many possibilities, but make a practical, logical choice to obey the word of the Lord immediately. Don't delay it. Don't wait to feel it. You don't have to have the emotion of it. Sometimes, again, sometimes people have a lot of emotional experience. I've seen this as a pastor over the years. Oftentimes, the people that show the most emotion change the least. And I don't know if part of that is not because the, mo the emotional experience deceives them to make them feel like they're actually doing it. That's not. The crying, the tears, and all that is, is not the same as obedience. The obedience is the actions. The obedience is the choices the logical, conscious, rational decisions to change your life. It's, it's not enough to cry, oh, I haven't been putting God first in my life. It's fine if you cry about that. You, you, I mean, in a sense, maybe we should. You have to make real choices right now. Okay, this is what I'm going to do to make it differently. This is what I'm going to do to change it. You know, this is something that I did a long time ago now, but... I made a conscious choice that I'm not going to watch any more political news. I, did, I haven't watched any political news for a long time. Is it a sin to watch political news? No, but for me it's a distraction, and I just didn't want that distraction in my life. It's a conscious choice. It's like when we choose to fast. You know, we chose what we're going to eat and what we're not going to eat, and we keep it. You discipline yourself. So obedience to God sometimes is just a matter of disciplining yourself and you have to discipline yourself. Don't wait for some miraculous feeling to come over you. Now I'm just everything different. Make practical choices. Practical, rational choices. Then you will grow spiritually and you'll be surprised. But if we just keep waiting for an experience or waiting for a feeling, oh God, just come and change me, it may never come. So we, because I think we, we've confused emotion with repentance. We've, we've confused emotion with obedience. And uh, we, we must make it clear. The emotion is not obedience. The tears is not obedience. The obedience is obedience. The be oh, actions, real, practical actions. There may be somebody in here right now hearing me. If you don't do what I'm saying right now, you will suffer severe consequences for it. Because this may be the very thing that's lacking in your life. Sacrifice, commitment, and obedience. That's why you don't change, because you won't pay the price. Pay the price, make the sacrifice, 
and see what God will do in your life. But don't be deceived. If you won't do this part of it, don't wait for a miracle. You won't get it. You won't get it. You won't get it. But if you obey, obey the plain word of God, you will experience new life. You will experience the power of God in your life. Help us, Lord, to make those decisions that need to be made that we can really personally experience the power of God in our own lives, in our own souls. Hallelujah, Lord. I just bless your people this morning. I pray the word, Lord God, will be sown in good soil. I pray that you will water it, Lord God, and I pray that the devil will not steal the word out of our hearts, but I pray for your protection and your covering over each one. And Lord, let us come back with a testimony of what God has done in our lives. Not because we ha- saw an angel or some miracle happen, but because we just chose to obey the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us feel the new life that comes in. Let us feel the power of God that comes in. Let us experience the blessing that God gives to those that tremble at his word and put into practice his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.